Welcome, welcome. We're excited that you've joined us for tonight's Power Hour of Torah, the Purim edition. We're going to get started right away with Maharat's president and co-founder, Rabbi Sarah Hurwitz. Hello, everybody. Nice to see your faces and almost Chag Sameach. Um, just by way of introduction, I wanted to share some thoughts before I introduced our wonderful panel. Um, I'm just well aware that we're about a year um, of this pandemic, and it was about a year ago that we were really beginning to understand how everything was settling in. Um, and so I have really in mind, as we are learning together tonight, all those who have suffered, who have been struggling for all sorts of reasons. And I just hope that the the year to come is filled with the essence of what Purim is supposed to be, of simcha, of joy, of happiness. Um, but I wanted to share a few words. So in many ways, the first chapter of Megillat Esther is a miniature version of the drama that gets played out in the first half of the Megillah. Instead of the Jewish people being the minority and Mordechai refusing to abide by the law of the land, it is women who must submit to their husbands and Vashti who rebels. And instead of Haman sending out edicts to warn the Jews of their minority positions, it is Mamuchan, who the Midrash says is actually Haman, who sends out warnings to all the women. And we hear in chapter one, Yishlach Sfarim al Midinat Hamelech al Midina Midina, um, dispatches were sent to all the provinces of the king, to every province in its own script, and to every nation its own language, that every man should wield authority in his home and speak the language of his own people. But unlike the resolution, the dramatic ending, the Vahanafahu for the Jews, becoming the leaders and saviors, where is the grand fix? Where is the grand big moment that straightens out and fixes the plight of the minority woman? So I wanna posit that Esther not only changed the story of the Jewish people, but she created precedent for me and for you and thousands of women before us to shatter the paradigm and emerge as a leader. And it's that moment in chapter five, verse one, on the third day, the Tilbash Esther Malchut, Esther put on royalty, she put on kingship, and stood in the inner court of the king's palace. So weird phraseology, what does it mean she put on kingship? Surely it should have said she donned a robe, she put on some kind of royal garment. No, she donned Malchut. What does this mean? Esther stepped into a role as a, as a Malka, as a leader the moment she made the courageous decision to save the Jewish people from Haman's destruction. It was at that moment that she didn't just put on royal clothing, but she stepped into power, accepted her authority as not only a Jew, but also as a woman. The Malbim makes this point and goes one step further. The Tibash Esther Malchut, what does it mean that she put on royal apparel? She wore royalty and it became a midah, an actual attribute such that all who saw her recognized how suitable the monarchy, monarchy was on her. As it says in Eov, Sedek levashti v'yelbasheni, I clothed myself in righteousness and it rode me. Esther had the moral courage to realize that her stepping up at great risk to her life and status was imperative to the future of the Jewish community, as well as to women writ large. She recognized her power and she stepped into it, learning to actively lead. The story is named for her, the book of Esther, not Ahasuerus or even Mordechai, as it was this very moment when she saw herself as a leader that shaped the destiny of, this, of, the, people, of the story. Perhaps that story of women serving men continued for a few more years, maybe even a few more centuries. But Esther propelled us forward, giving us courage to bask in leadership, to shift and shatter paradigms. I'm grateful to the teachers here today who are part of a long lineage of women and teachers and leaders who have donned royalty, have put on Malchut and stepped up into leadership. We are all better for it. And so tonight we will hear words of wisdom and Torah first from Rabbi Wendy Amsalem, who is faculty at Maharat. Um, 
uh, who runs our Bait Me Josh program, also graduated from our advanced caller program. We will hear from Judith, Rabinit Judith Levitan, all the way from Australia, who uh, will, who also graduated from our advanced caller executive, executive ordination track. Um, we will then hear from Rabinit Gloria Nisbacher. And, um, and then we will hear from Rabinit Bracha Jaffe. Jaffe. So we're in for a, a wonderful night of Torah and um, looking forward to learning with everybody. So Rabbi Wendy, turning it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I, I put in the chat a link to the sources. I'm, I'm not gonna read them through because we only have uh, 10 minutes together, but if anybody kind of wants them, they're there. If you click on it, you'll be able to see all the sources. Um, one of the things that I found very striking when I was reading through Migilat Vestair uh, this year is how much the story seemed to kind of resonate with our experiences during COVID. Um, if you remember at the beginning of chapter two, Esther's kind of living her normal life. And then suddenly, uh, because of the king's uh, decree that all of the beautiful women will be gathered together in the king's house, she's kind of stripped away from her regular way of doing things. And she finds herself kind of locked into this building without really any contact with the outside world, without any way to really kind of access the life that she led beforehand. Um, there's a sense throughout the second chapter that, um, that uh, Esther's isolation is, is, is really almost complete. Um, there's a description of how uh, in, in verse 11, we're told, Each and every day, Mordechai, her, her one relative, kind of walks around outside the building, hoping to catch a glimpse of her, hoping to hear some news of her. Um, this reminded me of those very painful pictures that we saw of family members gathered outside of long-term care facilities, kind of hoping to look through the window to catch a glimpse of, of their family members, right? There's a sense of Esther being kind of completely cut off from the world and completely cut off from, from any relatives that she has on the outside. Um, the Talmud in uh, Masachet Megillah on uh, Daf Yudimel Amud Aleph describes Esther's isolation even further. The Talmud says, why is it that she's given seven na'arot? Uh, and the Talmud says, she needs these seven na'arot. Shabbat. She uses these seven maidservants to count the days of the week. In other words, the same maidservant shows up every Monday, a different one shows up every Tuesday, a different one shows up every Wednesday. And that's the only way Esther has any sense of what day it is, right? She's so completely cut off from the outside world. Time is so kind of uh, amorphous for her that if, if these maidservants didn't show up, she wouldn't even know what day of the week it is. Um, and I certainly know that for many of us during COVID, we've also had a sense of time just becoming very sort of fluid and fungible. It's very hard to remember kind of what week we're in or what month we're in or what day we're in. Um, uh, and I think that, that as we read through chapter two, it seems like Esther's total isolation starts to have a real effect on, on how she thinks about herself. And I think that one of the things that we see in chapter two is that she really starts to lose her sense of self. Um, when uh, each woman is, uh, is preparing for her night with the king, we're told that each woman is allowed to request whatever it is that she wants. Uh, in verse uh, Yud Gimel, we're told, whatever the woman wants, she can ask for. But when it's Esther's turn, we're told, Esther doesn't ask for anything. She just kind of takes whatever Haggai will give her, which to me sounds like a person who like no longer has any preferences, right? She's she's kind of become deadened to the to the world around her. Um, the verse concludes, Esther found favor in the eyes of all who see her, which might at first sound positive. But the Talmud actually sees it as not being so positive. The Talmud says, why does, why does she find favor in everybody's eyes? Rabbi Elazar says, Everybody likes her because every person kind of sees in her what they want to see. Each person thinks that she looks like a member of his own nation. In other words, Esther kind of doesn't have a selfhood anymore. When she walks into the room, people don't see her as herself. They just kind of see her as whoever they want, want her to be, um, which again, I think speaks to kind of a a loss of a sense of self. Um, and our, our, our ideas of Esther and her kind of isolation 
uh, and her separateness from everybody, um, it becomes clear in chapter three that it's not just Esther who's in this mode, but actually the entire Jewish people are in a state of being sort of scattered and isolated. Um, if you remember when Haman first approaches Ahasuerus and asks to, to destroy the Jewish people, he describes them as in am mifuzar umifarad bein ha'amim. They're all sort of scattered and set apart amongst the nations. There's a sense that, that all of the Jewish people are, are not really able to connect to one another. They're all kind of living in little pockets all over the place, which I think, again, very sadly is, is, is resonant with the experience that many of us have had during COVID, a feeling of not really being connected to our communities, just being scattered about everywhere. Um, I think this isolation really kind of gets most fully expressed in chapter four of Megillat Esther. This is the, the chapter where we find out that um, Haman has gotten approval to kill all of the Jews. Uh, messages get sent out to the 127 provinces. As the Jews in each and every province hear this terrible news, they are mourning and crying and fasting and wearing sackcloth and ashes. Mordechai as well is mourning and uh, crying out and wearing sackcloth and ashes. And it seems as if every single person in the 127 provinces knows about this terrible decree about the Jews, uh, except for Esther, right? Esther there in the king's palace is so cut off from everything else that she has no idea what's going on. And when her maidservants tell her that Mordechai is wearing sackcloth and ashes, she's really surprised. And she she sends messages to find out, you know, why is he doing that? She doesn't even, doesn't know that anything is going on. Um, and I, I think we really get the sense that she she has no contact with 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 really with anyone, um, and uh, and and even her attempt to sort of find out from Mordechai what's going on is extremely belabored, right? If you look through chapter four, there are so many verses that describe Esther sending Hatach to Mordechai with a message. Mordechai then gets Esther's message, sends a different message back with Hatach. Hatach goes back to Esther, delivers that message. There's a lot of verses just kind of describing how torturous it is to even just get any information back and forth. Um, and when eventually Mordechai is able to communicate with Esther about the grave danger that the Jewish people is in, he asks her to go to the king and plead for the people. And Esther's response is basically, I just can't help you, sorry. I can only go to the king when he summons me, and he hasn't summoned me for a while, and so there's not much I can do. She sounds like a person who has no agency. It doesn't think of herself as a person who can, who can do anything about it. Um, and then Mordechai says a few things to her to try to get her to change her mind, but I think the most powerful of them is when he says to her in, uh, in chapter four, he says to her, Who knows, Esther? Maybe for this very moment, you become queen. And I think this kind of like sparks something in Esther and, and, and she starts to sort of think of herself as maybe a person who's deliberately in place for this very moment. And maybe there really is something that, that she can do about it. And, and from that moment on, Esther in the book of Esther is totally different. She becomes a very active presence. She has a plan. She tells Mordechai what to do. She maneuvers everything and she's, she's very successful. And in the end, uh, she's able to save, save the Jewish people. Um, and I think that when we look at Esther's behavior, there are a couple of kind of takeaways that we can, I think, uh, take away for, for our experiences right now during COVID. So I thought maybe I would quickly highlight what I think some of these takeaways are. One of them is that at the end of chapter four, when Esther finally agrees to, uh, to help out her people. Um, she tells Mordechai uh, in verse 16, Go and gather together all of the Jews who are living in Shushan. Fast for me. Don't eat and don't drink for three days and nights. And I and my maidservants will do the same thing. I think one of the first things that Esther realizes is that if you can't actually be with other people, doing the same thing at the same time as they do is a way of feeling connected, right? She can't actually be with her people, but she's going to fast for these three days. They're going to fast for these three days. And somehow, if they're able to kind of do that at the same time, she will feel her community supporting her and her community will feel that she is trying for them. Um, and I think this is something that a lot of communities have found, right? There are communities that daven together over Zoom, even though each person is in their own home, they're davening together at the same time they, they kind of feel like they're more together. There are families that have been able to celebrate different um, life cycle events and birthdays and things like that over, over Zoom. And I think there's a way in which if you can kind of eat the same food at the same time as somebody else, even if you're not in the same place as they are, uh, you can sort of feel connected to them. And also if you fast at the same time, you can, you can also feel connected to them. 
Um, I think a second important takeaway is if you remember in, a, in chapter uh, five, Esther comes up with her plan. Her plan is going to be to invite Haman and Ahasuerus to this very small meal. And to me, this image of this very small banquet with just the three people also kind of felt like a, a COVID situation, right? Many of us have had meals with only two or three people for the past year or so. And I think what Esther realizes there is that she doesn't have a lot of capacity to do a lot of things, but she makes the most out of what she has at her disposal, right? So what she has at her disposal is the ability to invite Haman and Mordechai, sorry, Haman and Ahasuerus to a, a small banquet. And using that, she's able to kind of um, get the king to be more suspicious of Haman, she manages to dislodge Haman from his position of power. And then afterwards, she's able to persuade the king uh, not, to, not to destroy the Jewish people. Um, I think another really important takeaway from, from the Megillah is, in, is at the end of chapter nine. If you remember what Mordechai and Esther do is they send messages out to everybody that uh, they should observe the 14th and 15th days of Adar as a festival. And in addition to it being Yimei Mishteh Simcha, or days of feasting and gladness, there will also be Mishloch Manot Ishlariehu, people should send gifts of food to their friends, Umatanot Le'avionim, and also uh, gifts to those who are in need. Um, and I think maybe another, you know, I'd say sort of lesson number three as a takeaway lesson is that if you can sort of share food with your friends and you can look out for people in need, that's a really important way to feel connected. Even though at the end of the Megillah, the people of Israel are still mifuzar and mifurad bein amim, they're still all scattered amongst the other nations, but they're able to kind of feel connected to one another because they can do these things. They can send each other food, they can look out for people who need help, um, and by doing that, they can they can be more united, even though they're not physically more united. Um, at the, at the very end of the Megillah, in verse 29, we have this great pasuk where we're told, Esther, uh, this is one of the very few times in Tanakh that the word Vatichtov appears, that a woman writes anything. It only happens three times in Tanakh. This is one of them. Um, so here, Esther and Mordechai together basically send messages out to everybody. And I think maybe another thing that they realize is that if you can't really be with people, then you should keep in touch with them, right? Send letters to them, write to them. Uh, that's a way of, of people feeling connected. Um, and I think the very last and, and most important lesson that maybe we can take for ourselves from the Megillah is this idea of v'nahafohu, right? That the Megillah is all about enormous changes coming at the last moment, right? At the beginning of the Megillah, the Jewish people think they're doing okay, and then suddenly there's a decree that they're all going to be destroyed, and then they're very worried that they're all going to be, they're all going to be destroyed, and then suddenly everything changes again and, and things are good again. And I think as we approach the anniversary of uh, what for many of us was the start of the COVID lockdown last year on Purim, I think there's a sense for us that there is a way that life was kind of in the before times, like before COVID, and then there was a very enormous change to the way that everything worked. Um, and, uh, and I think maybe what the Megillah is suggesting to us is that hopefully there'll be a change the other way also, that, you know, that things can not only change from good to bad, but they can also change from bad to good. And I think the Migila kind of encourages us to cultivate a certain amount of kind of resilience and hope that the way that things are right now is not the way that they will always be. We have to be prepared for things to get worse and also be very hopeful that, that things will get better. So uh, I think I just want to end off quickly with the bracha that just like the, the Jewish people in the Megillah go from Yagon to Simcha and from Evel to Yom Tov, that uh, this year on Purim, this marks that for us as well. We should be able to go from agony to joy, from mourning to, to great rejoicing. Um, and uh, I hope that next year it'll be a totally different set of lessons that we'll be looking for in Megillah Esther. Thank you so much, Reva Wendy. Um, we want to just pause for a moment and really thank our co-sponsors for this evening, Jofa and Sviva. Thank you so much for your ongoing partnership and support as we continue to raise up women's Torah. Um, next up is Ravani Judith Levitan. She is um, a community educator in Sydney, Australia, and she'll be sharing with us on Penafohu disruption and innovation in Mikila Esther. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Rabba Wendy and Rabba Sarah, for your words. And I'm going to uh, echo them. I think you can see I am in Sydney, Australia, but I'm also in the Maharat Beit, Beit Midrash. So, uh, you know, through the wonders of Zoom, we, we can connect. And it was so wonderful to hear from you and to learn from you. And I really would like to 
uh, I think, pick up that thread, uh, Rabbi Wendy, that you uh, sort of ended with about Nahafohu and talk about this idea of disruption. So as you both had mentioned, last year was the start of a global upheaval with the coronavirus. And I think that the Megillah describes very aptly the state of affairs in Shushan after Haman and Ahasuerus agreed to des destroy the Jewish people, to exterminate the Jewish people, Ha'ir Shushan Navocha. And for us, immediately after Purim, that was, I think, the sentiment that existed. The world was Navocha. We were confused and in disarray. Our foundations were shaken. And many of the assumptions, as you had mentioned before, many of the assumptions that we had about how we were going to live our lives or could expect to live our lives no longer stood up. And I also, too, I remember Purim being one of the last days where we were in shul together. And we effectively were then exiled from our shuls and from communal gatherings. And we were forced to shift our focus in how we celebrated and gathered together. So now, a year on, I think we, as you both mentioned, we can look back and reflect on this year. And we see with, you know, that initial upheaval from Purim has been a year really of sustained upheaval and sustained disruptions, not just to our day-to-day -day lives, but to the fundamental institutions and structures underpinning American society and to a lesser extent, I guess, in Australia. And this theme of disruption is a central motif that runs through the Megillah, just as it has run through our lives this year. So I want to just look, really interrogate a little bit further these dynamics, the dynamics of disruption that play out in the Megillah and look at what we can learn and how we can bring some of these lessons to our lives today. When we study the Megillah, and I thought I might just... Can I share my screen? Yeah. Pull it up. One second. So when we talk about the, uh, the Megillah, we see there are a number of trajectories there where there's change and disruption. So at the very beginning of the Megillah with Vashti and Ahasuerus, Right? We have this marital spat that's going on, but there's also something deeper there, right? We have, we're witnessing essentially the downfall of the Babylonian Empire and the rise of the Persian Empire. We have Vashti who descends from royalty to obscurity. And we have Ahasuerus who rises and basically consolidates his authority in no uncertain terms with power over half the world. Through the interactions between Esther and Mordechai, Esther starts off, right, as the orphan, and she rises to become the queen. She was someone who took orders, as Robert Wendy mentioned, right? She did everything that Mordechai said. And then she, she changes. There is, that, there is that change, and she becomes the one who gives the orders and, um, to Mordechai. So Mordechai initially was her protector. Now she steps up to be the protector of the Jewish people. And we see with Mordechai, he is first described in the Megillah as really the emphasis is on the exile, that he was, you know, the exile from, from Israel. And he rises to be the royal advisor. And at the same time, we have that, um, the downfall of Haman, who falls from grace and falls from favor with the Hashverosh and basically ends up dead. So, and we see also the fate of the Jewish people. The Megillah opens with the Jewish people really in that shadow of exile. We have that mention of the Kalim Shonim when we're talking about the, the feast. The, and that's the, our rabbis tell that's a reference to the Kalim of the Beit Samikdash. And we have the Jewish people sort of teetering there on annihilation and then finally redemption. And what we see in the Megillah is at the end of the Megillah, finally, when the chapter nine, we have the summary of what, of what is going on. The word nahafoch is used or hafach is used to describe the events that have taken place. And so it's once used to recount the victory of the Jewish people over their enemies. And then again, when recounting the specific events and the significance of the events for the Jewish people. So here at the beginning of um, chapter nine, 
we see ובשנים עשר חודש הוא חודש אדר בשלושה עשר יום בו אשר הגיע דבר המלך בדתו להעשות ביום אשר סיברו אויבי יהודים לשלוט בהם ונהפוך הוא אשר ישלוט היהודים המה בשונאיהם. Right, so they were, the enemies were going to overpower us and in the end the opposite happened there was a transformation the Jews overpowered their enemies and then again in chapter uh, in chapter uh, in chapter 9 in verse 22 We see Mordechai instituting the festival of Purim and he describes, and the way that the Megillah describes Purim itself and this month of Adar and the, the, the whole sort of episode, it's described in, this, in terms of this transformation. As it says, Kayamim asher nachu bahem ha-Yehudim me'oyevichem la-chodesh asher nehepach lahem as uh, Rabbi Wendy had mentioned before, So we have these days when the Jewish people experienced a degree of relief. It was a time of transformation from grief and mourning to joy. So I want to look a little bit closely at this idea of transformational change and to posit that what we have here is this dynamic of disruption. So what does disruption actually involve? There are two sort of elements in disruption. Disruption is often nowadays linked with innovation. So we have this idea, and I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that, that link between disruption and innovation. And the second idea around disruption, and this is kind of a counterintuitive idea, is that disruption is actually a very slow process. So this idea, firstly, if we look at this idea of disruption and innovation, The idea really came from a business theory of Clayton Christensen, who was a Harvard Business School professor in around the mid-1990s, and he talked about disruptive innovation. And really what that term was used there to describe was disruption, that there's a displacement in a market or in an industry or in a technology that produces something new that's more efficient, worthwhile or valuable. There is a radical change to the structure, whether that's a market or an industry and to how that functions. So if you think practical examples for us, think Netflix, think Airbnb, think Uber, think now with the pandemic, flexible work, think Zoom, right? These are, in Australia, we have, uh, well, we have socialized medicine and you can, you can call up a doctor Uh, instead of going to the doctor, uh, you can now call up the doctor and that is subsidized by the, the healthcare so what their system. So this idea of being able to talk to or connect to the doctor on telehealth or the psychologist on telehealth is also, it's sort of disrupted the whole way that we think about health and do, do business. And what we see here about disruption is, is it's at once destructive, right? It's destroying something, but it's also creative. So let's just keep that in mind. And then the second idea about disruption being a slow process. If you think about these innovations that we talked about before, if you think about Netflix, Uber, Airbnb, all those companies, all the technology, even Zoom that we're using, most disruptive elements don't start off like that. They start off really small scale, sometimes as experiments. And often they are tested and retested and refined. Disruptors begin on the fringe, on the fringe of markets or the low end of markets. And then they drift into the mainstream and take over. But so sometimes what we see is that takeover and it feels like it's really sudden. But often to get up to that takeover, what happens is it can take years and it can take decades. And we see this in the Megillah, this slow process. So what you can see here is, if we look at the timeline of events with the Megillah, we start off in a really sort of slow pattern, right? Year three of Ahasuerus's reign, 180-day feast, it's like a six-month feast. It's only four years later that Esther is taken to the palace. And she goes through this 12-month beauty regime. It's slow. Uh, and at the same time, we have, and we'll talk about this a bit later, but we have Mordechai setting his ducks up in a row. He's at that king's gate. He's at the Shara Melech all the time, pacing around, making sure, you know, 
Esther as the asset is in place and, um, and, and he can act if he needs to. And that action comes five years later, we're in year 12 of Ahasuerus' reign. And what happens there? That's when we have that feeling of upheaval, right? Because within three days, everything changes. The decree is issued to kill the Jews. Mordechai goes and prostrates himself in sackcloth. Esther comes, then she fasts. She goes before the king. That very day, there's a banquet. That very night, Ahasuerus uh, can't sleep. Mordechai is, is exalted. Then the next day, there's the banquet. Haman's dead. It all happens so quickly. So, but what we see is that lead up, there's, we, we, there's been this 12 year lead up, there's been this slow process before we have the, the complete substitution. And the other, the other thing that we see is that disruption is a creative, a creative process. And what we sometimes have is, it's a dual process. There's both destruction, but there also can be creation. And in the, in the Tanakh, we see this idea, we see the, um, the dual nature of this idea of hafoch uh, in Breshit, when we talk about Sodom and Amorah being destroyed and totally annihilated, that verb is used there. Everything is destroyed and there is total destruction. But then we have that same uh, verb used in Yona to describe what will happen to Ninveh. It says, Vayechal Yona lavo ba'ir mehalach yom echad vayikra v'yomar od arba'im yon ve'ninveh nehepachet. Right? Ninveh is going to be destroyed. But it's actually, is it, is it to be destroyed or not? The idea is that if there's tshuva, and Rashi in his commentary brings this, that we don't use the word destroyed. We use the word lahafoch, um, right? Because the idea here is that it can go either way. If the, if, if the people do tshuva, right, there can be this creative growth, learning and renewal or else the destruction. So this idea that it can go either way. And we also have this, um, this idea more broadly in the, in the Megillah of the story of Esther representing this radical departure from our traditional paradigm for redemption in exile. And the story of, um, the story of uh, Esther, we have this idea of the Jewish people in exile. The paradigm that we have for redemption is the paradigm, you know, it's coming up in a month almost from now. It's the paradigm of, of Pesach. Hashem swoops in and saves the Jewish people with the supernatural means. Whereas in the story of Esther, we have this radical re sort of constituting of how redemption is going to occur. Hashem takes the back seat and redemption comes through the efforts of human beings, through salva and through politics, through strategy through manipulation, through cultivating allies, we see the ascendance of human endeavor in relation to our understanding of Jewish law. The story of Esther sends at the end of the Tanakh, when the Jewish people are in the midst of exile, grappling with how to live as Jewish people outside of Israel and how to preserve the tradition and the oral law. And at the end of the story of Esther, uh, we have Mordechai and Esther instituting, you know, these innovations in terms of the festival of Purim. Purim is not a Torah mandated uh, festival. It's a festival that for all intensive purposes is fashioned by human beings. And if we look also in terms of our tradition at that idea of disruption being this slow process, there's this lovely um, midrash in Esther Rabbah that talks about, the, I'm just gonna move it here so, I can read it. That talks about the rabbis walking in the dark and then seeing the Ayala Tashachar, seeing the light come. And they describe the redemption of the Jewish people in this, in this similar way. Rabbi Chia, Rabbi Rabbi Shimon ben Chalachta, Havon Mehalfin, Bahada Bikah da Arbel. They were walking in a valley. The Chazon at Ayala Tashachar, Shabaka et Haora, that broke through the light. Amale Rabbi Chia Rabbala Rabbi Shimon ben Chalafa, Kahu Dulatan Shel Yisrael. 
This is how the Jewish people work. So slowly, slowly, the light comes little by little and it rapidly grows greater. And the source for that is from Micha. He eshev b'choshech Hashem orli. I'm in dark, Hashem is my light. And they, they bring it, they connect it to the Megillah. Kach betchila, the beginning of the Megillah, Mordechai yoshev b'shar melech, right? As we said before, he's got his asset in the palace and he's pacing up and down, he's making sure everything's going to be okay. After, even after he's been exalted and Haman has been humiliated, back he goes to the Shara Melech. And then he goes out in the royal garb. And then, then we get the pinnacle. But that redemption comes slowly, very slowly before it, it sort of breaks out into the, into the light. And so I think, like, what do we learn about the lessons of disruption here? I think what we can recognize is that disruption is a slow process that we need to keep plugging away so that we are ready for the unexpected moments when we can act. Just like that, me, like Mordechai mentioned, when we can jump and act. And also that we can choose how we can respond. We can acknowledge the destruction, but also embrace uh, creativity. And perhaps now, as we sit now a year on, just like the rabbis in Esther Rabbah who see those rays of sunlight breaking through the night, we are also catching glimpses of redemption. Uh, you know, in Israel, we have over 30% of the population vaccinated. In, in America, you've got your vaccination rollout happening. You can see there's been a bit of a shift in Australia, thank God, we are enjoying a sustained period of being COVID-free. We're returning to work, to shuls and to celebrations. And I think, you know, perhaps the, we see that the sunshine is slowly starting to break through the cold winter. It's coming. And may it be, may it be, uh, yeah, here at Son, that we will go and we will experience, as Rabbi Wendy said, this reversal this disruption, from mourning and suffering to joy and celebration. Thank you so much, Reveni Judith. Um, we will continue with Reveni Gloria Nussbacher, who's a community educator in West Hempstead, New York, and she'll be sharing with us on the tale of Vashti's tale. Thank you, Jen. Um, when my daughter was in second grade, her school perm play had a scene in which Vashti appeared wearing a long tail. Where did that come from? It's clearly not in the Megillah. And of course, the simple answer you get is, well, it's a medrash. But that begs the question, because the real question is, why did the rabbis choose to add this detail to the story? I'd like to put the story of Vashti's tale into some context. The story appears in the Babylonian Talmud in Masechet Megillah as part of a running commentary on Megillah Esther. The Megillah states that at the time that Achishverosh was making his big party, Gam Vashti Hamalka Astam Ishter Nashim, Beit Hamalchut Asher Lamelech Achishverosh. Vashti the queen also made a feast for women in the royal palace of King Ahasuerus. Picking up on the language that she made her feast in the royal palace rather than in the women's quarters, the Gemara asserts that Vashti wanted her party to be close to the king's party because both of them intended to commit forbidden sexual acts, almost as if they're expecting an orgy. Going back to the Megillah, on the seventh day, when the king's heart was merry with wine, he commanded that Vashti be brought before him with the royal crown to show the people and the princes her beauty. The Gemara picks up on this detail to understand that she's being asked to come naked, wearing nothing but the royal crown. And the Gemara picks up on the reference to the seventh day to understand that Vashti was being asked to appear naked on Shabbat 
and then explains that she deserved this humiliation because she herself used to take Jewish girls, strip them naked and make them work on Shabbat. It sounds as if the Gemara is just going out of its way to make Vashti look bad. But now the Gemara has a problem. They've portrayed Vashti as immoral, expecting an orgy. It seems that she should have no problem with appearing naked. Yet the Megillah tells us she refused to come to the king's party. So the Gemara needs to explain why. The Gemara posits two reasons. Amar Rabbi Yossi Bar Hanina, Melamed Sheparcha Bat Sarat. Rabbi Yossi Bar Hanina said, this teaches that she broke up, broke out in leprosy. Bumatnita Tana, Ba Gavriel Ba In a Braita, it was taught, the angel Gavriel came and made her grow a tail. Aha, here's Vashti's tail. The common theme of both of these reasons is that coming to the party in this state would make Vashti look ridiculous. There's no way she would appear before the king and his party goers looking like that. So there we have it. Vashti's tale was a miraculous intervention to make her refuse to come to the king's party. God acting behind the scenes to enable Esther to ultimately become queen. Yet this intervention, which is needed to make the Gemara consistent with the text of the Megillah, is only necessary because the Gemara has painted Vashti as sexually immoral, as wanting to participate in the king's orgy. There's another Midrashic version of the story in which Vashti doesn't grow a tail. This version comes from Esther Rabbah, written about the same time as the Gemara, but in Eretz Yisrael rather than in Bavel. This version also understands that Vashti was commanded to appear naked, but in this version, she pushes back. Seeking to preserve at least some measure of dignity, she asks to come scantily clad, like a prostitute, rather than totally naked. When that doesn't work, she tries to persuade Ahasuerus that it's in his best interest that she not come naked. She sent and said to him words that touched his heart. Amralo, Imro, Inoti Naa, Hinot Nin Enehem, Lehishtamesh B, Bahargim Otcha, the Imro Inoti Kura At Mitganebi. She said to him, If they see that I am beautiful, they will want to have sex with me and will kill you. But if they see that I am ugly, you will be disgraced by me. The Medrash continues. She hinted at this, but he didn't get it. She hinted again, a bit more clearly, and he still didn't get it. A commentary on the Midrash explains that she was using hints because she was sending her messages through the king's chamberlains and she wanted to avoid embarrassing Ahasuerus. Having failed to persuade Ahasuerus based on his personal interest, she next tries to appeal to his sense of royalty. Building on the Midrashic assumption that Vashti was the daughter of Babylonian royalty and Ahasuerus was not of royal blood, the Midrash has Vashti saying to Ahasuerus, when you were the head of my father's horse stables, you were accustomed to have naked prostitutes brought before you. Now that you have become royalty, have you not changed your corrupt ways? And then referring to a story in the book of Daniel where Nebuchadnezzar executed people by throwing them into a fiery furnace fully clothed, the Midrash has Vashti making a final argument. In my father's house, even people condemned to die were given the dignity of dying with their clothes on. How could you humiliate me in this way by requiring me to appear naked? So this is a very different picture of Vashti. In this version, she has a sense of modesty, of dignity, 
of concern for the proper behavior of royalty. And perhaps she's even thinking about Ahasuerus as well as herself. But the Madrash in Esther Rabbah also sees the bad side of Vashti. She is named as one of four women who came to power and oppressed the Jewish people. The others being Isabel, Jezebel, queen of Israel who murdered Jewish prophets during the time of Eliyahu. Atalia, the daughter of Isabel, who murdered nearly all the Davidic royal family in order to seize the throne and Shmiramit, the wife of Nebuchadnezzar, who was said to have participated in all of his wicked deeds. By including Vashti in this list of evil women, the Midrash is painting Vashti as not just evil, but really evil. And beyond this, in several places, she is called Vashti Harsha'a, Vashti the wicked. And she is harshly criticized for displaying the garments of the Kohen Gadol and for rejoicing over the destruction of the temple at the women's party that she made. So where are we? We have two pictures of Vashti, the Gemara's version of the sexually immoral Vashti who causes Jewish girls to work on Shabbat, the Vashti who has a tail and the wicked but modest and dignified Vashti of Esther Rabba, without a tail, which is the truer picture. The author of the Megillah doesn't tell us much about Vashti's character. We are told that at the time Ahasuerus made his feast, Vashti also made a feast for women in the royal palace of King Ahasuerus. And that when the king sent his officers to bring her to his feast, so that he could show off her beauty, she refused to come. There is, however, one maybe hint in the Megillah regarding the character of Vashti. The word used to describe Vashti's refusal to come is vatima'en. This is the same word the Torah uses to describe Yosef's refusal to respond to the overtures of Potiphar's wife. To me, this suggests that perhaps the author of the Megillah saw Vashti's refusal to appear at the king's party as motivated by some form of a moral decision. So perhaps the author of the Megillah views Vashti as closer to the Esther Rabbah version rather than that of the Gemara. Recent events have led me to think about these two different ways that Vashti is portrayed by the Gemara and by Esther Rabbah. I see them as paradigms for, of two ways of looking at people. In the Gemara's version, a person is either all good or all bad. There's no room for nuance. In our busy world where we are inundated with information, it becomes all too easy to slip into this mode of thinking. I have my heroes and my villains, and I can easily tell them apart. By contrast, the paradigm reflected by Esther Rabba's depiction of Vashti recognizes that people are complex. Our heroes may have flaws, and our villains may at times do something praiseworthy. Acknowledging this reality is hard and may create cognitive dissonance. After all, we want our heroes to be flawless and have trouble accepting that essentially good people may at times do things that are, or with the judgment of hindsight turn out to be wrong. But this doesn't mean we have to turn them into villains. And similarly, it may be painful to acknowledge when the people we love to hate do something right. So I hope that this tale of Vashti's tale will remind us that we have a choice of which paradigm we use in how we think about people and will encourage us to try to see others in their full complexity. Happy Purr. Thank you so much, Ravani Gloria. We will conclude our evening with
Ravani Prakajati. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us and for the patience listening to these beautiful words of Torah. I was blessed to learn with the Chabruta <clears throat> words from the Sfat Emet on Purim. It feels like a great way to prepare for the next Chag coming up, which is exactly what we're doing tonight. This past Shabbat was called Shabbat Zachor, which is always on the Shabbat before Purim. The verses that we read remind us never to forget what Amalek did to the Jews leaving Egypt, which perhaps gives us the impetus for the second part, which is commanding us to eradicate any memory of Amalek. But here's the question. Why do we always read it on the Shabbat before Purim? The answer that's usually given is that Haman, the main villain in the Purim story, was from the nation of Amalek. Here's the second question. What is Amalek's special strategy to weaken and attack the Jewish nation? And how do we see it realized in Haman's action in the story of the Megillah? The Sfatemet, Rabbi Yehuda Arye Leib Alter, the Gera Rebbe, who lived in Poland and was a Hasidic master in the 19th century, explains it this way. He says, Amalek weakens us, how? By dispersing us spiritually and ideologically. In Haman's words, when Haman tries to convince Achashverosh that the Jews are worthy of being eradicated, he says, there is a certain nation scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces, provinces of your kingdom. According to the Sfatimet, when the Jewish nation is splintered, it is our weakness and our downfall. Amalek capitalizes on this weakness. The Sfatimet continues, and he says, in each one of us, there is a spark of chayut, vitality, something that you may have heard of being called the pintalayid, the spark inside of us that reminds us that we're Jewish, and it is a spark with energy. That spark is what can unite us. We all have the spark inside of us we sometimes need somebody to ignite it. How did this happen in the Megillah? Well, here comes Mordechai. Mordechai was the one who brought us together and united the Jews during the miracle of the Megillah, the miracle of Purim. How does the Svetimet learn that? Through a Midrash from Esther Rabbah. Just give me a moment while I share the screen. First, we have the pasuk that I quoted, that the nation of Israel was scattered. But then we have this pasuk, which describes Mordechai, and here's the pasuk. Ish Yehudi hayam b'shushan habira, u'shmo Mordechai ben Yair ben Shimi ben Kish ish yemini. What does this pasuk say? It is the lineage of Mordechai. He was in the capital city of Shushan. But his father was Yair, and his grandfather was Shimi, and his great grandfather grandfather was Kish, and he was from the tribe of Binyamin. That's what Ishimini means. The Midrash and Esther Rabbah says, wait a second, if we have this whole lineage and we know he's from the tribe of Binyamin, why do we need these two words, Ish Yehudi? We know that he's Jewish. So the Midrash, in the way that Midrashim does, do sometimes, reinterprets this pasuk and rewrites this word and said, oh, it doesn't mean Ish Yehudi. It means ish yichidi, this special person. Yichidi means unique or dedicated, individualized, something special. This person, Mordechai, he was the one who brought God's name, the God ha-yichidi, the only God, into the world. And that's what made him special, miyuchad, from the same word. Sheyichad shmo shel ha-kadosh baruchu ba'olam who specialized and individualized God's name in the world. And how did he do this? He did this by uniting the Jewish people. 
and I would add to the Sfat's Emet's word and words and to the Midrash and Esther Rabbah. Ishechidi, he was the only one. He was the only Jew who seemed to realize this, remember this, and had this spark inside of him, which he used to ignite others. What did he do? First, he ignited the spark in Esther, his ward, who was in the palace. And he explained to her that she was in such a unique position. And he was able to ignite that spark and convince her. And in a moment, she decided, I need to do something. And what did she do? She in turn used that flame to ignite and light that spark in others. What does she say to Mordechai? I'm willing to do something. I'm willing to put my life on the line, but what do you have to do? I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray to God, even though those aren't the words, but I'm going to fast in prayer and entreat God to help me because I am willing to walk into that throne room, even on pain of death, in order to convince the to allow us to fight back as Jews and not to eradicate our people. But you have to do your part and you have to get all the Jews to come together. That same spark that you ignited in me, I want you to ignite in the, in the hearts of all the Jews. And they did that. All the Jews in Shushan came together for three days. They all prayed together with Esther and with her maidens. Sfatemet continues and explains that the Jewish nation went through a transformation throughout the story of the Megillah. At the beginning, they were scattered among 127 provinces geographically, but worse than that, they were scattered nationally, ide ideologically, and spiritually they were not together. But then he points out that when we get to the end of the Megillah, he sees that the Jewish nation became united and came together. And he shows us through a beautiful, close reading of a pasuk, which I will share again with you. At the end of the Megillah, when the Jews are gathering together and celebrating that they conquered their enemies, it says, those in Shushan came together, etc. Ushar Hayudim and all the other Jews, Asher Medinot HaMelech, in the other 126 provinces of the king, Nikalu came together, Ve'amod al nafsham, and stood on their souls, or stood on their lives, or preserved their lives. But look how interesting. Nikalu means they came together in the plural. There were many people. But when they preserved their lives, they did it as one because Amod is in the singular. And the Sfatimet notices this. And he said, you know what it's like? It's like what we just read in Parshat, Parshiot, in the previous Parshiot, about standing by Har Sinai. By Yavomit Bar Sinai, all the Jews came in plural to, Har, to Mount Sinai. By Yachanu, and they camped by Midbar. By Yichan Sham Israel. And Israel camped as one in the singular. And Rashi famously says there, Ishachan Belevachan, one man as one nation with one heart. Continuing on, there's another pasuk. Everything that Mordechai wrote down with Esther's help, the mitzvot that we should do to preserve and commemorate this wonderful miracle. The Jews agreed, they accepted on themselves, but not in plural, it actually says the word kiblu written, but that's not the way we read it. We read it as kibel, that they did it as one. What did they accept on themselves? Accepted on themselves the wonderful mitzvot of Purim. The mitzvot of Purim are all about uniting us. They're all about reaching out and bringing joy and as the Sfat that Met says, bringing more love between us. Mishloch Manot, sending food. I mean, who doesn't like getting fun food from somebody else, especially when there's a theme? Matanot Lev Yonim, seeking out those who need financial help and giving it to them. Suda, gathering together in, in a festive meal with others. Kriyat Megillah, reading the Megillah actually should be done in large groups. Yes, we can do it in different groups, but we shouldn't have too many splinter groups. Berov Am, we should gather together so that God's name is publicized and the miracle is publicized in as many larger groups as we can. 
Yet still today, today we don't have that opportunity to gather as large groups. And perhaps we need even more for our pintalayin, for our spark inside each one of us to ignite the joy and the unity to others. Perhaps this year more than any other time, we need to reach out, whether it's with a smile or maybe having a suda on Zoom with somebody else or sending Mishloch Manot to somebody who really needs it. We're really seeking out those who need financial help. This year, more than any other year, we want to make that effort because we can't be together, that we should feel united, if not geographically, then in our hearts. to all of you. Thank you all for being here tonight. We're really grateful that you were able to join us. Thank you again to Jofa and Sviva for your ongoing partnership as we continue to raise up women's Torah. Um, Power Hour of Torah is a series. So we look forward to reconnecting with everyone for our Pesach, for our, perm, for our Power Hour of Torah, the Pesach editions, a lot of peas tonight. Um, and we hope that you all have a Chag Sameach, wishing you all well.